What a do, boo boo. Happy Saturday. We're here. I guess it's actually Sunday morning now. It's after midnight. We're here for our secret sermon. We dip into the secret teachings of Jesus. Um, lately, we have been looking at... We've done some from the Gospel of Philip, but mostly the secret book of James. James is in Jesus' brother. And we've just been skipping around, jumping through the portions. Um, and we're rounding out the end of the book of James, you guys. We're practically theological scholars. Oh, my God. So, yeah, basically, I have had this interest in reading the Nag Hammadi scriptures and looking into them and studying them. But I have, like, when am I going to do this? So I decided to incorporate it as a weekly lesson. And we do this on late Saturday nights because... The, uh, the Jewish sages uh, believe that there is a powerful window open in time in the liminal space in the midnight hours between, you know, yesterday and tomorrow. And so during that time, we are going out of our comfort zone, even though we're tired and we're crazy and we're out of our brain juices, but we're pushing through that. We're pushing through the discomfort of the flesh and we're trying to learn and open ourselves up to the light and receive enlightenment and fulfillment and build the vessel. So it gives us so much more wisdom and insight and blessing when we kind of use this time and do this late. So yeah, and also, you know, it's after midnight, it's forbidden, it's very dangerous, very exciting. <laughs> All right, and so, you know how we do this, but for anyone who's just joining for the first time, I'm going to read the portion, um, probably poorly out loud, <laughs> reliving the childhood trauma, and then we will go back and unpack every line or so where something stands out. Okay, all right, and sometimes I get into characters, Jesus and the other disciples, so hopefully you can tell what I'm doing the different characters. Okay, this portion is called Few Find Heaven's Kingdom. When we heard that, okay, and so, by, by the way, just a little backstory. So this takes place after the crucifixion and the resurrection, um, the disciples are meeting with Christ in a sort of um, ascended non-physical form where he is, um, I don't know, I guess reviewing some of the material and the important teachings he was leaving them with before he left. And he was ready to ascend into the other kingdoms and mysteries and continue more work that Jesus the Christ had to do. Uh, but the disciples were clinging to the flesh. They wanted Jesus um, with them, and they needed him to reassure them and 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 keep teaching the things that he was like. You, I've already been telling you guys this. This is like material we've been going over for like a year or two now. <laughs> like, like I don't know. I need to do other things. Uh, but yeah, so they were kind of like holding on to Jesus, and he was like, "Okay, let's like get all on the same page." And then I'm like, "I gotta go." So this is like in that time period where he had stayed behind for a few weeks and was still very close to them before he completely transitioned and ascended into the heavenly mysteries, okay? All right, now I will begin. When we heard this, we were delighted. We had become gloomy because of what he said earlier. But when he saw us happy, he said, "'Woe to you who are in need of an advocate.'" And woe to you who stand in need of grace. Blessed will be they who have spoken out and acquired grace for themselves. Compare yourselves to foreigners. How are they viewed in your city? Why are you anxious to banish yourselves on your own and distance yourselves from your, from your city? Why abandon your dwelling on your own and make it available for those who want to live in it? You exiles and runaways, Woe to you, for you will be captured. Or maybe you think that the Father is a lover of humanity, or that he is won over by prayers, or that he is gracious to one because of another, or that he tolerates whoever is seeking. He knows about desire, what the flesh needs. Doesn't it desire soul? The body does not sin apart from the soul. 
just as the soul is not saved apart from the spirit. But if the soul is saved from evil and the spirit too is saved, the body becomes sinless. The spirit animates the soul, but the body kills it. The soul kills itself. I tell you the truth. He certainly will not forgive the sin of the soul or the guilt of the flesh. For none of those who have worn the flesh will be saved. Do you think that many have found the kingdom, the heavens? Uh, do you think that many have found heaven's kingdom? Blessed is one who has seen oneself as a fourth. <laughs> Starting over on that sentence. Blessed is one who has seen himself as a. Hold on. Blessed is one who has seen oneself as a fourth one in heaven. <laughs> choppiest writing. I don't know if it's because it's like translated from another language or like, and it's like ancient. I have no idea, but it's always so choppy. Okay. So very interesting. There's a couple of like points that really stick out to me. So, um, let's go back and we'll unpack it line by line. When we heard this, we were delighted. We had become gloomy because of what he said earlier. But when he saw us happy, he said, so I feel like the, the disciples are always really perturbed about what Jesus is talking about because they they misunderstand him a lot of time or they don't understand him all the way. And then when they think they've understood him, they get really excited, but they've usually missed the point. And so then Jesus has to come in and be like, all right, you know, the party's over. Like, I feel like that whenever we pick up from this, the people, the his disciples are always like, you keep telling us this, Jesus, and we think we're doing it, but then you keep telling us that we need to do it, and we think we are. <laughs> and it's just like, I just feel like it's like this constant frustration between him and his pupils. Um, but when he saw them happy, he said, woe to you who are in need of an advocate, and woe to you who stand in need of grace. Now, the woe to you who are in need of an advocate, I, I think that he's saying, like, I worry about y'all people who need so much outside validation from everyone. How do you have integrity when you you care so much about having other people reinforce you or give you the certainty you're looking for? You are looking for outside of yourself, for people to tell you what you are born knowing, what is within you that you can tap into but you're choosing not to tap into that. So I worry for you because you're, you're not mastering your own domain. You're not the, the master of your own. You're not the master of your own domain. You're not the, the chooser of your thoughts. You're not the chooser of your feelings. You're not making proactive, um, conscious free will choices for yourself because you're wanting to make sure that you're pleasing everybody else or that someone's giving you permission or that someone's going to give you like reassurance that everything's fine or that you're going in the right direction and you need to have sovereignty over yourself. You need to be able to say, okay, I'm going to make this decision um, with my backbone in it and I'm going to have conviction about it and that's going to be, you know, I'm, I'm going to stand by my choice or I'm going to take responsibility. I'm going to own it. Right. And if I make a mistake, then okay, I made a mistake and I'll make it right. But like, I am going to take ownership of making this decision. I am going to be um, in charge of my own life. I'm going to be at the helm of the ship, guiding and directing my cell with inner authority, authority over my life, right? Authority over my inner landscape and my inner being not at the mercy of the changing of the winds. You know, I'm not fair weather, you know, consciousness. I, I have to be eternal like the creator. The creator is not swayed and mutable um, because of the moods of the other people around him, right? Or him, her, it, you know, being this. So um, also, woe to those who stand in need of grace. So it's like if you're always in need of someone like cleaning up your situation or making allowances for you or, you know, giving you grace, like, um, you know, being, if someone's giving you grace and that implies that you've done something that's kind of like that you've stepped out of line or that you've messed up or that you're not standing in the shoes that you could be standing in, right? That you've fallen short somehow or that you've missed the mark, right? So if you've fallen short or missed the mark, that's really what sin means. It's like you've missed the mark. You've missed the point. Something is off. Something is off path. You're out of alignment. 
um, when it's talking about the body being affected by this by sin, it's like, okay, well, when things are off, when you're not in alignment, when you are not living in alignment with that spirit self, with that higher self, then that means that you're being more open to negativity, to toxicity, to emotional patterns that go through your body and wreck it with chemicals and hormones, right? So being in a state of heaven gives you a healthy body also, right? And, and being in a state of hell takes a toll on your body. It just does. So woe to you who stand in need of grace. I think that's too, it's like, hey, get your shit together. Like if you are master of your domain, I keep thinking of Seinfeld, or, um, you know, if you've got your kingdom in order, if you have self-control, that's, I think, to me, I think that's the most important of all the fruits of the spirit is self-control. Because if you can, if you have self-control, then that means that you can pause and slow down and observe your thoughts and take a breath and take a beat and observe your feelings and then make a decision based on wise discernment. Wise discernment that you've lived and embodied and you can look with a sense of prophecy ahead and say, okay, I can troubleshoot and I can also foresee how my, decision, my decisions and actions are going to play out, right? So yes, the person who's always in need of grace doesn't know, they don't have that authority. They, they don't know what they want and how to get it and where to go. You know, they want someone to tell them. They don't want to take responsibility for, you know, having conviction in their decisions because they don't want it to be their fault if it doesn't work out, right? So blessed will, be they who, will they be who have spoken out and acquired grace for themselves. And I think this is the, yeah, blessed are those who get out there, know what they want, say what they want, speak up for themselves, speak up for others, speak up for, you know, what's good, what is um, in alignment with the light, right? We want to speak boldly and speak life. And we, our words, like we're, we're powerful, magical beings. We have the divine animating us and so our mouths our words are very very powerful and so we can wield that power um you know adam spoke the names of the of the um the animals you know he we he he had dominion over nature right he's a divine human being we are the divine human beings we have dominion over nature we are the the keepers and the stewards of the garden, right? And so we are the speaking kingdom. We are the only kingdom that, that really speaks, that has, like I know a parrot can like parrot or you know mimic you, but like you, the parrot doesn't have like full on conversations with like full consciousness, you know what I mean? Okay, so blessed are they who have spoken out, like name it and claim it, speak your, speak what you want into being. And acquired grace for themselves. And so, yeah, it's like, know the laws of the universe, know those spiritual laws, and align yourself with them. Learn how to, like, okay, you're not going to just, like, get in the car and let it drive itself. You're going to learn how to drive the car, right? If, if you're not driving the car, the car's going to run off the road. Well, there are governing forces at play all the time and our thoughts and our feelings and all this, this, this stuff around us and within us is, is creating like this frequency around us, right? And so, uh, <clears throat> I lost my train of thought. What's her name? It's broken up. I was getting on about something about um, manifestation, about speaking things into being um, and using that power. Um, Woe to you, in need of an advocate. Woe to you, and blessed are they who have spoken themselves and acquired grace for themselves. Oh, wielding the forces of the universe. So yes, yeah, so it, 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 you have to know what these spiritual laws are. Align yourself with them, learn them, start practicing them, and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, okay, I'm not reacting to life coming at me anymore. 
I am becoming the creator of my reality because I understand that if I keep myself in a in a, a faithful certain state of being at one with the light and affinity with the light, the more like the light I become, it's like the more harmony I live in all the time, the more everything is working out and like it just things flow with ease. And even when things are going haywire around me in the world, my world still feels pretty good. You know, it's, I'm not affected by the storm because I know who's in the boat with me. So when I am ready, I can say, all right, storm, be calm and the storm will be calm, you know? So you learn to govern those forces. You learn to govern yourself in harmony with the forces of the universe. And all of a sudden, your life will start working out a lot better. It's like you don't have chaos. You don't get as sick all the time or, or whatever, right? Things, you are blessed <laughs> because you are putting yourself in that state and you're keeping yourself there and you know how to do it, right? It's a practice for you. And once you know it, you can't unknow it and you can't unlearn it. Um, okay. Compare yourselves to foreigners. How are they viewed in your city? Why are you anxious to banish yourselves on your own and distance yourselves from your city? Why abandon your dwelling on your own and make it available for those who want to live in it? You exiles, you runaways, woe to you for you will be captured. Okay. So this is saying that like this physical world that we're in, we're foreigners here. This is like play, make believe. This is all an avatar, a game. We're really the spirits and the souls that live within these physical dwellings. And so we, we're, we're like foreigners here and this isn't our home and we are kind of like outcasts, but we're not, we're not fully owning who we are within the land that we've come to, to make this opportunity work for us. Like we can use who we are on the inside in this realm that is not our, like, necessarily our most natural state. This isn't the real home. This isn't our real home. We're just here visiting, um, having this experience, and bringing our perspective from where we truly have come from with us to have that context, to have it within the context of this realm, right? So meaning that we get to learn how to be human here and then feel how hard it is and then remember who we really are and then figure out, oh, this can be a lot easier and it's still hard, but it's all of a sudden like, oh, okay, I know how to like connect with miraculous energies and this is getting really good. Like you, you, you rise above the consciousness that you were at and you never go back. Right, And so then you start owning your inheritance, the inheritance of being equally divine and equally human um, when you know how to work within the governing forces, you know, and you, this whole world opens up. You exiles, you runaways. Oh, okay, so why would you want to abandon your dwelling on your own and make it available for those who want to live in it? So yeah, this is like wishing you were somewhere that you're not or or, or trying to, you know, being not being glad that you're alive, not being grateful to be alive here on earth. The, uh, like, being an animated soul in a body is a privilege. And if we're not grateful for our lives and we're not actually grateful to be here, to have an opportunity to bring forth our soul's purpose, even just to correct our own soul. Like we've come here with assignments and we have to evolve on a personal level. It's not just about what we come here and do outside in the world, like for a job. That's another part of this where it's like, okay, we're foreigners in this land. We're so worried about like all these errands we have to run, but we're like, we're a foreigner in a land. Like we're not even from here. What errands do we have, right? The real important part is that we do the soul correction while we're here. That's our real soul's purpose. And then it falls within all this other stuff that we have going on, the circus going on around us, right? So, where were we? 
Oh, yeah. So don't abandon your dwelling because someone else wants to live in it too. I mean, there are other souls waiting to come in. We can only correct our soul and do all that work while we're here incarnate in these bodies and until we realize that we've basically been just like spinning our wheels and wasting a bunch of time and burning valuable time here right and it's okay because we can always make up for lost time you know we can have revelation of like enlightenment in, in a second and be like oh oh yeah i get it probably won't happen that way <laughs> you have plenty of time to suffer you will live as long as you need to to get the work done here unless you start racking up more debt than you're paying off if you start like really fucking yourself over with like negativity you, you might be taken out right just so you don't do any more damage right before you have to incarnate again and make it worse on yourself um, you exiles and runaways, woe to you, for you will be captured. So yeah, if you aren't taking ownership of choosing who you want to be in this world and where you want to go, everybody else is going to want to take that ownership for you, including all kinds of spiritual influences that want to basically have easy pawns in their schemes to mess with other people and to like feed off of that energy of that negativity. I mean, if you start becoming like super aware and super conscious, then you will see moments that the people around you are basically being puppeted by your own demons to mess with you. And when you see it happening, you're like, wow, they have no idea right now, but like my demons are actually using you as a meat puppet to like push my exact buttons. <laughs> so you're not even in the driver's seat. But the more people are take ownership of their own consciousness of their own thoughts of their own like they don't need someone to tell them what to do or to give them permission or to tell them it's okay or to be like no I approve or I understand if you're just like well I don't really need anybody to approve of me I don't need anybody's permission like then you're also not going to be as easily influenced by you know some let's just say it's an influence that comes and you don't know right so that can happen I mean, think about what really motivates you to go in this direction or that or to choose this or that. And so the ego can, can choose for you. The shadow self, other people's egos, other people's shadow selves, other people's fear is going to choose for you. You know, the, the negative um, influences and energies around people and around yourself are going to try to influence. So you have to use your free will to rise above and to transcend and to make those choices and to own it and to steer keep your ship steering right in in your direction the the direction that you decide on with the creator right but even in that instance it's like you have to take that inspiration that's given and just and own the choice because Jesus keeps saying like even if you like you can ask me to save you, but I can't save you. You have to decide to be saved. Like, you have to choose to be in the kingdom, right? You've got to do it. It's up to you. Um, or maybe you think that the Father is a lover of humanity or that he is won over by prayers or that he is gracious to one because of another or that he tolerates whoever is seeking. And what I think this is is... Jesus is calling people out because he's like, okay, you think that God is like this anthropomorphic person who's like, oh, I get it. I understand. Or like, oh, I'm mad at them. It's like he's not making these like judgments based on a personality, right? He's, he's not like God is an energy of beingness and it is what it is. And it's like you, the, the governing forces are not making like, exceptions or like oh well well you know this isn't a person right the, these are like this is systems and laws and like the physics of spirituality that you have to like move within and if you do this then you will get this result and there's no real changing that or swaying it miracles can come in um but you cannot rely on living on those all the time like you will have a cosmic debt to pay off so when you learn the laws and the rules and you work within them, then you will see exactly why what is happening to you is happening to you. You will be like, oh, okay, I understand that that's the consequences or the side effects of doing this. 
I get it now. It's not, I'm not being punished by God. It's just that if I am in a terrible mood and I'm moping around and I'm talking about how victimized by God I am, then I am just vibrating bad shit and I'm going to be attracting more bad shit. And there's nobody up there going like, well, I wish you wouldn't do that. You know, it's just like, this is, it's like magnetism, radio dial. There's nobody to like, be like, well, I know that you meant to dial in to this station. So I'm just going to like, we'll just call it even, you know what I mean? You're either dialed in or you're not. So that's what I think that that means. Um, he knows about the desires, um, he knows about desire and what the flesh needs. Doesn't it desire the soul? The body does not sin apart from the soul, just as the soul is not saved apart from the spirit. But if the soul is saved from evil and the spirit too is saved, then the body becomes sinless. The spirit animates the soul, but the soul, but the body kills it. The soul kills itself. So these governing forces, this beingness, this pure consciousness, God, for simplicity's sake, well, they just use the he. He knows about the desire, he knows about desire and what the flesh needs. Because the body, it just, it needs what it needs to survive. And it was built like this, right? And then it's, it's the perfect setup to play on the soul cravings, right? Because the soul is the part of us that is, it's not, it's, it's in between the, the physical and the spiritual. The soul has the ability to transcend and to grow and evolve in consciousness, but it also has the ability to be flawed and shadowed and it needs to be corrected. And that's the whole point. That's why we're here. It's just like going to school, right? Like a student isn't like a terrible piece of shit because they're a student and they're in kindergarten and they're not in 12th grade yet graduated from high school, right? You're just like there to learn. Like that's the whole point. So the soul isn't like a piece of shit because it was like flawed and like, we, I mean, we can't help ourselves. We're trying like <laughs> for lifetimes we're trying. Um, yeah, it's just that, um, yeah, it just is what it is. The soul um, doesn't desire the soul. The body does not sin apart from the soul. The soul just, uh, apart from the soul. This is the soul is not saved apart from the spirit. Yeah, so the soul is here to go through this correction. That's the whole point that it's here. And so the soul is meant to be tempted with, with um, go, getting off path, right? That's the whole point. So we're, we're working on strengthening the soul, transcending the soul, evolving the soul, and correcting the soul. That's the point of our incarnations on earth. So we can't do that apart from the spirit. We have to be able to rely, like the flesh on its own is dead. So the, the soul helps animate and gives us personality, right? It gives us our uniqueness of who we are. But we can't fully heal the soul without the spirit. The spirit is the part of ourself. It's like that higher self version that is completely untainted, right? And so that's the part of us that we merge closer to as we break down the shells of negativity that separate the soul from just merging completely with the spirit. The spirit is perfect. It's the part that is complete, pure divinity um, translated into the us that we are. And it, that the spirit is the part where the more that we evolve in consciousness as we start to leave this realm into the, the other, we start to shed the layers and layers of our personality, which becomes more and more pure light, pure energy. And that's where we just sort of dissolve back into the light. So the more, it's like, as long as the spirit is attached with the soul, we have that personality. And I think that maybe we have the personality of our spirit for a long time, uh, but there's a, a highest, highest point where we're just completely reabsorbed and we don't have any kind of consciousness or personality anymore. Um, okay. But if the soul is saved, hold on. The soul is not saved apart from the spirit. But if the soul is saved from evil and the, and the spirit is too saved, then the body becomes sinless. And I think that, um, I mean, obviously what that's saying is that when we when we're saved, 
the soul is ascending to Christ consciousness. That's the highest state that any human being can get to. Um, and so that's what Jesus came here to do as the Messiah was to um, unlock this level of mystery that opens our heart realm that we can like tap into higher realms and higher realms of consciousness and other dimensions and um, and spiritual growth within ourselves. But the more that we do that and the more that we merge with that light body, it literally corrects the things that are wrong or the ailments in our own physical body and ignites like the... Um, like the regenerative, the regenerative cell regrowth and all of that stuff. So actually the more, the more that we shed our, our, our layers of negativity, the baggage, um, the, the self-defeating parts of ourselves, the better off physically we become the healthier, the younger, like the more glowing and radiant. The spirit animates the soul, but the body kills it. The soul kills itself. So the body is just always like the moment we, the, anything physical is made, there's a shelf life and it just starts to expire. I mean, it just does. And so the soul is the part that has like the connection or like the capacity of negativity and negativity, um, darkness, you know, death, it's, it's, it's all connected and it's just breaking down, breaking down and rotting and becoming refuse. So anything that's connected to negativity, fear, selfishness, all of those things that creates death slowly over time. Whereas the further we get, we, we separate ourselves from those negative, uh, aspects that selfishness, shame, self-defeatism, you know, all of those negativities, the further we get away from that and transcend it, then the further we get from actual um, physical vulnerabilities. And then even too, when we die, it's like we don't, we're not threatened by death because we've transcended it because we know that it's only an illusion. And so it doesn't hold any kind of dominion over us. Um, it's, it doesn't uh, control us while we're alive. It doesn't keep us enslaved or in fear or, or gripped or whatever. Oh, the soul kills itself. I mean, we're kind of like in a process of soul death all the time. Like we, it's like birth and death and birth and death. Like the soul, like the process of soul is to like die to the soul. I mean, it is what it is. And that by like the soul screwing up all the time. It's like causing more like death in itself. But then I don't know, the more we overcome, like we die to the ego parts. So it's just death, 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 death. <laughs> I tell you the truth. He certainly will not forgive the sin of the soul or the guilt of the flesh for none of those who have worn the flesh will be saved. Okay. So what this means is like, he will not forgive the sin of the soul or the guilt of the flesh, meaning you can't get out of the assignment when you come to earth. The only reason that you come here is to cor do your soul correction. Um, there's like, you can get a lot of insight into that soul correction when you get like, when you look at your natal chart, especially if you get like an astrological um, explanation of your natal chart. But basically that's like your soul assignment, the, the map of your soul of your whole life. It's like, this is what you're supposed to be working on and overcoming and facing and transcending, right? So we can't get out of that. There's, there's no other purpose for why we're here. It's the most important thing we're, we're here to do. So if we don't do that, then we're going to be held accountable for like not having made any effort. So that's something that we just can't, we're not going to get off the hook, right? There's no, like, there's no way around it. We have to do the soul correction while we're on earth. Um, and that's why we keep incarnating and reincarnating so that we can do that. Um, let's see. For none of those who have worn the flesh will be saved. And I think that this is also um, pointing out that no one who has ever been a human being has actually gotten to the level of Christ consciousness except for Christ. 
is very high, very, very empathic, very pure, very, um, it's a, it's quite a stretch. There have been other human beings that have come close who have been able to ascend and like leave their body like when they were ready. But I don't even know if they were Christ consciousness level. And that's the highest we can get as human souls um, in, within the realm of this physical dimension. Not even just like on the earth. Um, do you think many souls have found heaven's kingdom? Blessed is the one who has seen oneself as a fourth one in heaven. But that's such a hard sentence to say. Blessed is one who has seen oneself as a fourth one in heaven. And I think at that point, it's like, that means that you are part of the Trinity and the Trinity is part of you. That you see yourself as an equal component or like, maybe not an equal component, but uh, like a, an actual aspect of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the, you know, the human Son or whatever. Like when you are truly one with that and that is one with you, it's like then you're a fourth in the component of the Trinity. And so that, that is a blessed place to be. And it's implying that only the only other human being that ever got to do it is Jesus. And then maybe you can, you can join that that grouping of, you know, Jesus has ascended, then you would be like up in the Christ consciousness, you know, as a, you, you get what I'm saying. I'm sorry. I'm getting tired and I'm running out of brain juice, but we made it to the end of the portion and it only took 36 minutes <laughs> and aeons and mysteries and thousands of years. All right, y'all. Well, I hope this was good for ya. I hope that we've saved our souls. I know we're probably confused and disoriented, but I think that the overall point of this was that blessed are the people who aren't looking outside of themselves for validation. You're not looking outside of yourself for a guru. You're not looking outside of yourself for someone to give you permission. You are attuned with the light. And you are attuned with your own spirit and you can discern and listen for yourself and you can own your decisions and feel conviction in them and own your mistakes too and not look back and not look back and regret, but just own that power and own, own your own dominion. All right, you guys, I'm going to eat the macaroni and cheese that I brought from work. It's really really decadent and then I'm gonna take a really nice shower and I'm gonna to go to sleep and then it's gonna be Mother's Day and I'm gonna rush home and I got mother a cake I got her a coconut cake she kept saying how nobody has any coconut cake so I found a coconut cake pretty easy and I got a key lime pie and I got some other Mother's Day goodies and yeah so happy Mother's Day to all of you and uh, don't get your mama that crappy, like, mixed flower bouquet if you're stopping at the store on the way to see her. Get the roses. The roses are always better than the crappy mixed flowers. All right? Remember my big bouquet? You could do a lot with those, with those grocery store flowers. And you can get another bouquet of just, like, those, like, cute little filler flowers that aren't baby's breath. And then mix them in if they're, if they're like, a nice complementing color. Okay, like do it up, do it up. You can do it like fancy style, but like on the, on the, like on the budge. All right, you guys, good night.